Well, today I want to talk with you about the subject of, of forgiving family members. Forgiving family members. You know, the family can be um, such a tremendous source of, um, of joy. It's a place, obviously, where, where memories are made and um, sometimes uh, things that, that uh, are issues now, you know, you add about 10, 15 years later and, and you just see laughter um, about it when uh, one is, uh, is recalling um, something that was just so important, sometimes between children, um, that was so important that just turned out to be just nothing. And so there's, there's laughter, there's the making of the, of the memories, there's, there's the everyday rituals um, that, uh, that can, uh, can occur. I, I remember in, in our family, uh, an everyday uh, uh, or every week ritual um, was uh, Friday family nights. Um, it, it, was, it, it, was, it was known that that was kind of a time just for our family. Now, obviously, that, that um, went away here when my brother and I, when we, got, when we got older and we got into high school and, and that type of thing. Uh, but there's other, other activities and, and those type of things. But it was those times where we could depend on, where we were all together, um, we would, we would eat together, we would, we would play uh, together, uh, we'd maybe watch a movie together. I mean, it was just this dependable type of, type of, uh, of ritual that, uh, that occurred. Families can be such a, a tremendous, tremendous source of joy. Families can also be a source of pain, a source of pain. There, there's no one that knows you better than a family member, right? Nobody knows you better. Um, there's nobody that, that knows your strengths more than your, than your family members. There's nobody that knows your weaknesses more than your family members. There's nobody that knows uh, what, what you're really confident about uh, more than a family member. And there's nobody knows uh, what you struggle with uh, than, than a family member. Um, and so when words are shared amongst the family, when, when sometimes actions are taken within in the family, because it's the family, that can be an incredible source of, uh, of pain. Uh, family members can, can hurt one another because they're human. And us humans, we are broken. We're, we're broken, right? We, we confess that in terms of our sinfulness each and, uh, each and every Sunday, each and every day. Uh, parents aren't perfect, and neither are children. And nobody's perfect. So you, you, you've, you've got a bunch of broken people coming together and, uh, and living life. And, and in families, uh, eventually, things are going to be said and things are going to be done that cause hurt um, in relationships that then need to be... Um, to be mended. So whether the, whether the pain's intentional or it's unintentional, forgiving fellow family members is, is just, it's vital. It's absolutely vital. And that's what I want to focus with you uh, today on. I want to turn to the scriptures with you and, and to address this topic, I want to talk about, about Joseph. Joseph. Uh, jo Joseph's father was, uh, was Jacob. His mother was, uh, was Rachel. And let's start in uh, Genesis chapter 37, please. Genesis chapter 37. We'll start with, uh, with verse 3. Genesis 37, verse 3. <clears throat> now Israel... That was just another uh, designation, another name for Jacob. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his children. Well, well you know right there, that's a problem, right? <laughs> you, you're right off from the, from the bat here. We're, we're going to, uh, we're going to have, uh, have a problem. You know, you know when, I, when I call my folks, occasionally I, I will say, it's your favorite son <laughs> that's calling. And there's a little kind of running joke between uh, myself and my brother and my, and my parents um, on that. We obviously know 
that they don't have a favorite son. Um, though if they did, <laughs> but, but, but we know that they, but we know that they, they don't there. Here, here it's, uh, here, you know, it's, it's pretty naked right out here, isn't it? Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Now you can look at that and you can say, <laughs> there's some gasoline for the fire too here, right? <laughs> but you know, as Luther said, put best construction on things. And so the best construction is, is he's, he's simply relating this, this dream here that he, that he had. Verse eight, his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. Let's go now to verse 19 of chapter 37. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dream. Down to verse 23, please. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they threw him and threw him into the, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Now down to verse 28. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Israel. Verse 31, same chapter. Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their brother, and they said, This we found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Well, this, is, this is a horrible occurrence here, right? I mean, this is a family here that's, that's just... Um, ripped apart here and just, just terrible actions that are, that are occurring. Well, in Egypt, in Egypt, Joseph is, is sold again and he's sold to the household of Potiphar. <clears throat> Potiphar was in charge of Pharaoh's guard. Potiphar's wife falsely accuses Joseph of rape. So Joseph winds up in prison. Joseph then in prison interprets some of the Pharaoh's dreams and the Pharaoh takes a liking to him. He's released. Joseph comes up with a strategy to deal with a famine in the land. And so he goes from the pit to the prison and he becomes a prince from the pit to the prison, and he becomes a prince. His brothers come, and they're seeking food. And they don't realize that the person that they come before is their brother. They don't realize that 
the one that they had cast into the pit was now the prince. Let's go to chapter 45, verse 4. Chapter 45, verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Verse 8. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Verse 10. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. So his brothers sell him into slavery and God uses it to bring him to Egypt. He's purchased by Potiphar and God uses it to teach him how to manage. He's thrown into prison and given the opportunity to interpret dreams. And God uses it to win the favor of Pharaoh. God can take every bad thing and bring good out of it to those who love him. That's the promise we have in Scripture, isn't it? That all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Just a little aside here on Joseph. Notice the comparison between Joseph and Jesus. <clears throat> Joseph was loved by his father, so is Jesus. Joseph was the shepherd of his father's sheep, so was Jesus. Joseph was 30 years old when he began his public service. Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. Joseph was sold, falsely accused, bound in chains, and condemned with criminals. Jesus was sold, falsely accused, bound in chains, and condemned with criminals. Joseph cries out to forgive his brothers, and Jesus cries out from the cross that we are forgiven. And God uses the evil execution of Jesus to bring about the redemption of the whole world. Here's the point I want to dwell with you on. When we come to forgive fellow family members, look past, by the grace of God, the hurt Look past to the good. Look past to the good that God will bring out of a situation. Look at Genesis chapter 50, please. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? 
Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. A key then, by the grace of God, in forgiving the family member, is focusing on God's promise to use every situation and every word, every hurt, and bring some good out of it. This is seeing then, just as Joseph did, it's seeing past the pain the words or the actions have caused. This is not a denial of what has happened. This is not, not what psychologists would, would call repression, where you just kind of try and snuff it and push it, push it back. It's not a denial of that um, which has happened. It, it's, not a, it's not a, boy, I'm sure I'm glad they said that, or I'm sure I'm glad that that terrible thing happened. No, it's not the denial of it. It's looking past it, to the promise of the good that God says, I will bring out of it. Because when we look past pain and focus on the promise of God and the goodness, it's part of, indeed, by God's grace, the forgiveness then of the pain we've experienced. See, Joseph didn't have amnesia of what his brothers did to him. Right? Because he said, I'm, I'm your brother. You, you know the one you threw into the pit? Huh? See? Not that he just, just forget it. But what, what is he saying? He says, but, but this is what God brought out of this. I wound up in Egypt to prepare for that which was coming and the famine for the preservation of the people. I learned how to manage, even though I was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of rape. I wound up in a prison, but you see, all of a sudden I became a person of influence to Pharaoh. God gives me the plan how to deal with the famine, and I become prince. So that, bigger picture here, the promise that goes all the way back to out of this line of people the Messiah comes is now preserved. Here's someone who doesn't deny what had happened to him, but he's looking past the pain, and looking past the pain to the good that God can bring out of a situation or situations, God uses them as part of the promise or part of the process whereby by his grace, we then looking to the good, we then can forgive the pain that has occurred. Let's see it again. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. Verse 51. Uh, 51. Genesis uh, 41, 51. Joseph named the firstborn his firstborn, Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Now, look at the word forget there. D does that mean that he had no recollection? Well, no, because he just says, he's made me forget all my hardship. Well, that's not somebody who's forgotten his hardship, right? Because he says, he's made me forget my hardship. Forget in one sense that he can look to the good of what God brings back. And in looking to the good, he can then go back to forgive that which occurred. So he names his child that. The second, verse 52, the second he named Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my misfortunes. There's, a, there's somebody who doesn't have amnesia here. It was exactly what happened. He even names it. Misfortunes. All this stuff that happened to me. 
But what? Is he, fo- is he focused on the misfortune? Is he focused on the word? Is he focused on the day? Can you imagine the horrific image you would, you would have in your mind as your brothers throw you into a pit and, and hate you to that extent? I, I mean, it's not that 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 all of a sudden has disappeared, but here's the one who out of his pain is looking to the fact that God has made me fruitful in the land of misfortune. There's one who looks to the good that God brings out. And it's part of the process of his being able to forgive his family. We see then past the words and past the actions and focus on how God can use everything to his purpose. Maybe the good that came out of the hurtful experience in your family, maybe the good that came out of it is a greater dependence on your part on the Lord Jesus Christ and his promises. It doesn't, that doesn't deny the pain. But the dwelling point isn't the pain. The dwelling point is, and look how God took that terrible situation and brought this good of greater dependence on him, how God brought that out. Maybe it is how God takes the tremendous pain of what was said, what was done in the family, and God has brought the good out of it that now you are able to minister in a special way because you have walked that road. You're able then to minister as you look then to the good that God brought out, your ability to minister to people that have been hurt in their families and can talk about the steadfastness of the love of God and the promises and the strengthening. You see, that's looking past the pain to the good. Then you return back to the pain. And when you focus on the promise, God uses all of that as part of the process by his grace of forgiving. Also, when we struggle to forgive a a family member, it can can be because we've lost sight of the massive sin debt that God has forgiven us. I mean, just reflect in your own life here now. Reflect on what it is that we say on Sunday, that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, what we've done and what we've left undone. Just think of the thoughts you've had this week. The words, what you've done, what you didn't do, that you should have done. You see, this massive sin debt that God has forgiven us. And when we struggle to forgive someone, doesn't mean we condone it. It doesn't mean that we're just going to be forgetting everything. It might be because we, we can't doesn't mean necessarily there's going to be reconciliation because that might not be wise to do that. But, but to let go and to not hold the offense against that person anymore and to look toward the good, which is the forgiveness that's been won for us on the cross, then we, then we loop back and it puts the situation into a different perspective, doesn't it? I think of... Uh, 1 John chapter 1. Let's turn there, please. Good way to find 1 John. Just go to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Slowly work your way towards Matthew. You'll very quickly run into the, the Johns. 1 John chapter 1. And there we read, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, how, God, how God must love having his words spoken and sung back to him, right? Um, 
That's what we do in the liturgy. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Notice again how it begins in eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. See, that's looking ahead to the promise of God and we understand who we are and the massive sin debt that God has forgiven us of. And then we turn back because God uses his word to empower his forgiveness. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. The second part of, of verse 10. There we read, there is no one who's righteous, not even one. There's no one who has understanding. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There's no one who shows kindness. There's not even one. Their throats are open graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You see, that talks about the depth of sin. So as we look forward to good that God brings out, as we understand the depths of our own sinfulness, we also then understand that Forgiving of the person for that person's words or actions, that's not a one-time event, right? That can be a daily occurrence. Daily occurrence. It's not one and done. It's daily. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your promise that even out of the most terrible situations, you can bring good out of it. And so, Father, give us eyes that are born of your promise that we can see even out of painful situations within a family. Help us to see good that you have brought out of a situation like that. Lord, remind us each and every day of the incredible debt that you have forgiven us. And Lord, empower us to forgive the fellow family member each and every day. You have forgiven us, and so send us forth to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen.